Hello and welcome to Speech Communication 4397, Effective Meeting Management. Today, Dr. Hahn is out of town just like she said she'd be. And we're fortunate to have as our guest speaker today, Dr. Robin Williamson, who's chair of the communication department at the University of St. Thomas. She's going to talk to you about all kinds of really important things that you need to know, so pay good attention and ask good questions. Thank you, Dr. Williamson. Good afternoon, or good, af good evening, if you are in the evening audience. I'm delighted to be here today. Dr. Hahn and I have been friends for many years, and it's always fun to be a part of her classes. Today I'm going to talk about group dynamics, and it's very complicated to talk about group dynamics in an hour and 15 minutes, but we will do our best. What is a group? You live in groups, you're born into groups, you work in groups, you play in groups. Groups are pervasive in your lives. What are some of the groups that you belong to? What do you, what do you belong to? Yes. Used to be in a fraternity. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I guess uh, I belong to, if in a larger spectrum, uh, a group of students. So, okay, group of students. Right. You belong to a fraternity. You're part of a department. Those are groups. You're part of a family group. There's so many groups that we're a part of, and we're not even aware of it. So what is a group? Well, basically, a group is a collection of persons in face-to-face -face relationships with one another. And each person is aware of his or her own membership. And the other persons in the group are aware of their membership as well. Well, and this seems rather odd that why should other people be aware of your membership, but you can't say that you're part of a group if other people aren't aware of your membership as well. So it's important to us to understand what this means. Something else that's very important is that we're in face-to-face -face interaction with one another. We sit around, we see each other, we talk to each other, hopefully we understand one another. So we're in the process of sharing and creating symbols with one another. So that's what a group is. Now we're going to begin to talk about all of the variables that impact group dynamics. And we're going to start out with the Rosenfeld model, or at least a facsimile thereof. Now, Rosenfeld developed a system of variables by which we can explain group dynamics. And he believed that if we look at groups of variables, we can understand what's going on. First of all, we look at group composition. Group composition basically has to do with the individual members, who they are, what their traits are. Are they communicative apprehensive? Are they argumentative? Are they open? Are they disclosive? Are they deceptive? Do they have a burning issue? I'm sure we all have burning issues. I mean, we've been experiencing burning issues over the last 24 hours on the television. Uh, there are many, many burning issues that we've been exposed to on the media. We all have burning issues. Uh, people have different personalities. They diff have different attitudes and values and beliefs. And when we bring all of this into a group situation, we have a potential for misunderstanding. And one of the reasons why we do is something called selective perception. Did anyone see Nightline last night? Mm hmm Classic example of selective perception. No matter what anybody said, uh, no matter how good their reasoning was, if they were entrenched in a particular position, 
they could not or would not understand what other people were saying. This is a classic example of how attitudes, values, beliefs, and perceptions affect what we do in a small group. Now besides the individual members and how their varying personalities can affect the group process, we also look at things like group size. Now there's a lot of difference between a group of three and a group of 20. Both are considered small groups. But what, what could be some of the differences between a group of three and a group of 20? Anybody think of any? Yes? A group of three is probably going to be more personal, a relationship between the members. Uh, group of 20, I think, uh, you're probably going to establish some kind of hierarchy or pecking order as far as who's in control and things like that. Excellent response. When you have a group of three, you have more of a, of a power equality situation. Now, you still may have one dominant person, and there may have to be a coalition established, but there, at least there's more of a chance for interaction and equality of power. When you have a group of 20, immediately coalitions start. So excellent response. Uh, b besides that, compatibility is important. Do people get along with each other? We saw last night at the town meeting, there was little compatibility. So what happened? Nothing. Nothing really was accomplished. When there's lack of compatibility in a group, we have problems. We can't communicate with each other, and we can't go on to the task at hand. So just looking at these first groups of variables here, in terms of the group composition, the individual group members, the size, and the compatibility will make a difference in what happens in that group. Now besides these types of things, there's some other things that affect us. Now I'm going to take this off for just a minute and put some other models on here. There are different kinds of patterns that we can have in groups. We can have patterns of interaction. Who talks to whom? Now, these are a couple of different kinds of patterns um, that are interesting. Uh, the first one is called the why. Well, the why situation is where uh, we have member one being the leader of the group. We have two persons who are alienated who speak to that person. Uh, then we have another alienated person, number five, who speaks through four to one. Do you think this type of pattern would be very effective? No. Because um, not everybody is speaking to everyone else. Here's another example of a fragmented group. We have the leader in the middle with each individual person speaking to the leader, but not to each other. Again, problems for group dynamics because we're not hearing everybody discussing uh, a similar situation. Now here are two other patterns um, that are perhaps a little bit better. One is better and one isn't. Um, the one on uh, the right is called the, the chain or the V. And again, we have individual people speaking with other people to a leader. Again, we do not have people talking to each other. Now, the one that, of course, is the most successful is the circle. We have all persons equal in the group. Everyone speaks to everyone else. And in this type of situation, uh, we have a best chance for solving problems, resolving conflicts, and getting the task at hand done because everyone has a chance to be heard. Now, besides communication networks, we can also have attraction networks. We can have everybody liking everybody else. Or we can have coalitions. We can have a one liking two, three liking four, five liking everyone. So we can have attraction networks as well. Now, we hope in our groups 
and our small group situations that our patterns of interaction uh, will be like the wheel where everybody talks to everyone else. Now let's go back um, to our Rosenfeld characteristics and look at operational variables. Now operational variables talk about procedures. What kind of procedures are going to be operative in the group? Are we going to have an agenda? Are we going to have a brainstorming situation? How are we going to handle our meeting? Also, uh, we have to look at things like roles. What kind of roles are we going to have in the group? Now, there are a variety of roles um, that we find in any group situation. The first of these is a task role. These are the people who get us going. These are the people who, when people go off on tangents, say things like, I think we better return to the question at hand. Um, or these are the people who say, uh, come on, folks, let's hear your ideas. They're the energizers, the people who uh, get us to think about things. Then we have the all-important critic. And although critics irritate us, because we would like everything to go smoothly, the critic keeps us honest. Uh, this is the person that causes us to look at a situation and decide whether or not we truly have made a good decision. So these are just a few of the task roles that we have. Now besides task roles, we have a socio-emotional roles. Socio-emotional roles are those wonderful people who keep everything smooth. These are the harmonizers, the compromisers. This is Ginger in our classroom here. Um, these are the people who provide social grease. Uh, they get us in and out of the situation easily. They are extremely important in group maintenance and group management. And then lastly, we have a role that perhaps can be dysfunctional. We call these individual roles. These are marked by hidden agendas. These are our class clowns who have, for their purpose in life, to make people laugh. Now, making people laugh is wonderful, and it provides a certain amount of tension release. But when it becomes a role, then it can be dysfunctional because we begin to laugh and party and have a great time and we forget the task at hand. Other individual roles are special interest pleaders. And if we go back to our situation last night, the town meeting, we saw lots of those people. They could not be concerned with trying to get beyond the verdict trying to get beyond the trial, moving on to problem solving because they were stuck. They were stuck in their own particular perception, so they were special interest pleaders. Now certainly everything that they had to say was very important, but when we get stuck in a particular situation, then we can't deal with the task at hand and we can't get beyond a particular situation to solve a problem. So they, too, get in the way of the group function and the group role. Now, these three types of variables, the group composition variables, the structural variables, and the operational variables, all impact four things. They impact, first of all, the task. The task is the goal or the purpose of the group. Suppose, for example, you have a group of people who are highly compatible, would rather have fun than work, they are highly socio-emotional, and you've got three or four class clans. What's going to happen? 
Yes. Well, no work done at all, because the natural tendency would be to flow with the clown. In other words, why work if you don't have to? It's just a natural thing of human nature. It's built with the territory. So the clown will take over the dominant position, therefore becoming basically your aggressor, and will destroy from within the task that has to be accomplished. Absolutely. Excellent response. What happens is they all have a wonderful time, but they don't attend to the task at hand. Besides the task, we have the, the outcome. And of course, the task and the outcome are very much interrelated. What is accomplished? Sometimes groups have a wonderful goal. Maybe they have a desire to start a food bank uh, or a clothing uh, distribution center. And they have all good intentions. But their outcome is flawed because perhaps they hadn't done enough goal setting, they hadn't uh, set their agendas, uh, they had problems maybe in their group interaction, maybe a leader never emerged. And so even though they had a wonderful goal, their outcome was not realized. Um, going back to our, our meeting of last night that we saw in Nightline. I don't think that Ted Koppel was really able to accomplish the goal that he had in mind. So his outcome was flawed because of the nature of the group. Thirdly, group atmosphere will certainly play a role. The emotional climate if people are all at each other's throats, if they all hate each other, then even if you have the most noble goal in mind, um, the group atmosphere is going to affect everything else that happens in the group. And also, going along with group atmosphere, is the physical and the social environment. It, too, will impact the task and the outcome and the functioning of the group. This is a very useful model because it helps us focus on some key important issues that we have to be aware of when we set up our meetings. And it's much better to be aware of the pitfalls before they happen and try and plan for those than get into a situation like Ted Koppel did last night and oops, things go wrong because of compatibility issues uh, because of other kinds of issues. Yes? Do you think the commentator or moderator, Mr. Koppel's task was, I'm asking you, what do you think he was trying to accomplish? Because I certainly couldn't see what he was trying to accomplish except maybe higher ratings or getting people's uh, passions stirred up or maybe to expose and mock the judicial process. I mean, that's basically what come out of this town meeting. People are disgusted with the judicial process and not every trial is handled like this trial that was the subject of this town meeting a lot of trials get done in three days and they result in verdicts and that's the end of it this thing was a monster of a trial what do you think he was trying to accomplish well the what i think he was trying to accomplish was get people to move beyond the verdict all the emotionalism and move on to dealing with some of the difficult issues and the problems that were stated. Now that's very difficult to do in an hour, but that's what he was trying to do. I think it would be much better if he had held that town meeting in a year after emotions had subsided. Because like with everything, emotions subside through time. Then that's the time to deal with some of these difficult issues not when everyone is so entrenched in their own position. So I think what he tried to do and what was actually accomplished were two different things. Yes? Now let's move on to some of the basic foundations of group theory. Now that we know some of the variables that we have to look at, let's look at group theory and groups per se. Now these particular foundations are based on Kurt Lewin's uh, theory of groups. And he's really considered to be one of the fathers of groups 
and group theory. He was a social psychologist and a systems theorist. He believed that we had to look at all members of the system as well as the environment to understand what was going on in a group. Now his first principle is one that I think we will all understand, especially uh, in the light of our current social situation, and that is that the perceptions of the person are absolutely critical. They are critical factors. Now we certainly saw that uh, last night. One of my favorite stories illustrates this point, I think, uh, very well. I'd like to tell you the story of a man named George Danzig. Now, George was a mathematician, and he was going to school during the Depression in the 30s. He was a very, very bright young man. He was going to the University of Chicago, and he was finishing his senior year. Now, we all know that the, t the Depression time was a time of hardship. It was a time of anxiety because people many times didn't know where their next meal was coming from. So, George had one last class to go, one last final, and it was some class in higher mathematics. And in this class, there were four people who had a shot at an assistantship. This is the only assistantship that the mathematics department was going to be offering for graduate school. It was all the money that they had. And there were four of them in contention for this assistantship. Now, George knew that he was kind of in the middle you know, he wasn't the brightest, but he wasn't the least bright of these four bright people. He knew he had a good shot. Plus, he was a very, very hard worker. So when, he, when it came down to studying for the final, he studied for the whole week before, and he studied all night long. Well, finally, he fell asleep about 6 in the morning, and the final was about 9 o'clock. And he slept through his alarm. Well, he woke up about 9.10, absolutely panicked. The final had already started. So he threw on his clothes, raced to the final, got there about 9.25. 25 minutes of the final had already gone by. And in these upper mathematics classes, the problems are simply dreadful. He needed all three hours. He knew he was already behind, so he really had to work hard. This was his perception. Well, the professor had left the test questions on the desk, and so he raced up, got the test questions, and looked at them. They were awful. They were some of the worst problems he'd ever seen. But he had studied, he'd prepared, he was bright, he knew he could do it. So he sat down to work. Well, in the time that was left, he finished the eight problems, and he knew that he'd gotten them all right. But there were two additional problems on the board, and George said, well, I wonder why the professor didn't put these on the paper. And then he thought, oh, well, you know these professors. You know, they always have these last-minute questions that they want to ask us. So he knew, according to his own perception, that he'd gotten 80% right. Yeah, okay but not a, good enough to pass the class, but not good enough for the assistantship because he knew that one, is, one of those other people would get 100%. So he started to work on problem nine. Well, it had to be the most complicated, worst problem that he'd ever seen in his life. It was awful. He didn't finish it. The professor came back to collect the papers. George was heartsick. And so he went up to the professor and said, may I please have a little extra time? Now, these are the kind of problems where you cannot cheat. Taking his paper home wouldn't make a bit of difference whether or not he solved it or not. So the professor knew George was a very good student, very diligent, and so he said, okay, you can have until 9 o'clock to 
tomorrow morning. I know how much this means to you and you know what a factor this will be in the rest of your life. So George went home. He had breakfast since he had not had breakfast and then he commenced to work all the rest of the day taking only a few breaks here and there for coffee. About one in the morning he solved problem nine. Hooray! He had gotten an A, at least. He knew he had gotten 90%. So he took a brief break, and then he worked all the rest of the night. He couldn't do 10. He just couldn't do it. It was beyond him. So he went and turned in his paper. He knew he'd gotten an A in the class. His perfect four-point grade average would not be flawed, but he knew that he hadn't gotten the assistantship because he hadn't gotten them all right. So he went back to his room and he went to sleep and he thought, well, I guess tomorrow I'll join the soup lines. Well, about four hours later, he heard this frantic knocking on his door. George, George, hear this, George, George. <coughs> and his professor was knocking on his door and screaming, George, George. Well. His professor never spoke above a whisper, and he never got excited about anything. So he wondered what in the world was the matter with his professor. So uh, George opened the door, and he was a little groggy at this point since he'd been out, up for, you know, like 48 hours without much sleep. And so he opened the door, and the professor was jumping up and down, gave him a big hug and said, George, you've made mathematical history. And George said, by getting a 90% on the exam? He said, oh, no, George. You got 100% on the exam. You solved one of Einstein's unsolvable problems. He hadn't heard the beginning of the lecture, that the professor was trying to give the students some encouragement, that even if they didn't solve all eight, it was OK. Because after all, there were two problems that Einstein couldn't ever solve. But because George didn't have the perception that they were unsolvable, he solved one of the unsolvable. This is my favorite story of perception. And it shows so well that if we don't have a perception of failure, if, it, if we have a perception that we can accomplish something and do something, we can. Likely, if we have a perception that, that something is insurmountable, it will be insurmountable. The second of his foundations has to do with how we look at ourselves in relationship to other group members. It has to do with the relationship of ourselves to other group members. Now George, when he was in this particular situation, looked at himself as being, you know, maybe a little brighter than some, but maybe not as bright as some. He looked at himself in comparison to the other group members. The third aspect is that we move toward goals in our group. We all have group goals, and we all have individual goals. And we move toward those goals. George moved toward his goal. He worked very hard. He studied hours and hours and hours. He went beyond the call of duty to try to solve an unsolvable problem. And then the next idea is that our behavior can be explained in terms of our goal directiveness, or at least it can be explained in terms of trying to reach a goal. If you are a, a special interest pleader, for example, you are going to do everything in the group to get the group to listen to your idea. Um, if you, for example, maybe your group is trying to raise money to send a needy child to camp and you feel that the very best way to do that is sell pizza 
And the other group people think that the very best way to do it is to have 50 million bake sales, and you feel that they're totally wrong, you will do everything in your power to be sure that they sell pizzas rather than have a lot of bake sales. So you're going to do everything you can. George did everything he could to make sure that he got as many problems right as possible. And then lastly, the field always contains certain barriers. There are barriers in the field. It may be the difficulty of the situation. Um, it may be people's perceptions where they can't begin to look at someone else's point of view because they're so entrenched in their own. Um, until people are able to role play, to see other people's uh, positions, then conflict, problems, solutions will never be found. So these are a few foundations about group theories. Um, that when we are in a group, we're going to have certain perceptions. These perceptions are going to guide our behaviors. We're going to look at ourselves in relationship to other people. We're going to have goals. We're going to try and move toward those goals. And our behavior in the group can be explained by our movement toward those goals. And then the field will always have barriers for us. Now, I'd like to turn to some basic research assumptions about groups and things that will affect groups, things that group, groups have got to have, or variables that groups have got to have to be successful. So I'd like now to talk about some key assumptions associated with groups. First of all, let's talk about what all effective groups must have. Well, first of all, all effective groups have got to have a goal. They've got to have a reason for being. Otherwise, they just sort of muddle around. You've got to have a reason for why you're doing what you're doing. You've got to have a goal. So, of course, some of the first things that you do is you have to have goal-setting meetings. And you need both long-range goals and short-range goals to get you to your ultimate accomplishment. Besides goals, groups have got to maintain themselves internally. Why would that be important? Why would groups have to maintain themselves? Anybody? Well, if you have people coming and going all the time, and you are constantly having to redefine where you are, what you're doing, what's been accomplished, then you're always taking three steps back and one step forward. So you never get anywhere. Um, you have to be able to have some kind of consistency in your group membership. And then lastly, in terms of effective groups, they have to be able to develop and change in ways that improve their effectiveness. We all know the story of the dinosaur. Well, there are groups that are dinosaurs. Um, there are group members that say, why should we do things differently? We've done the same thing the same way for the last 30 years, and it was fine for my father. Why isn't it fine for us? We've all been in groups like that where people don't want to change, they don't want to adapt, they don't want to meet the changing physical and social environment. And those groups ultimately will be dysfunctional or they'll die because they're not changing and adapting to current situations. All communication is dynamic. It's always changing. We're always changing. You're not the same people that you were a year ago. Now you've got a core identity, but that identity is always growing and changing uh, because of the new experiences you have. Well, groups are the same way. They're always growing and changing and developing. And in order to meet their goals, 
in order to meet the needs of the group members, they've got to change and adapt. Okay, the second idea um, is that all groups need leaders. Now, there are a variety of different kinds of leaders and leadership styles. Probably the least effective is the autocrat. Now, the autocrat is very good on task, very good on procedure, uh, usually has a, an agenda that is written in stone uh, or concrete and never will be changed. Um, this person can get a lot of things done, but usually the autocrat um, has a control problem and persons in that kind of group become dissatisfied because they don't have any power. Uh, we all feel, we all need to feel like we have some influence in groups. That's one of our basic interpersonal needs, to feel like we have some kind of control or influence. Another type of leadership style is the benevolent dictator. The benevolent dictator maintains a firm hand, but at least this person has the best interests of the group members at heart. Again, the problem may be that the group members don't feel like they have enough input into the decision but at least they don't feel like they're being run by Simon Legree. These next two are usually more satisfying for groups. Uh, the consultative approach, where members feel like they have some input into the decision. There is a discussion. The leader or leaders ultimately make the choice but at least the group members have some power and some impact on the decisions that are made. And lastly, and probably the one that's most difficult to maintain, uh, but most satisfying for group members, is the participative approach. And this is where we have equality of power. The group leader is a manager. Uh, manages the decisions, but the decisions are ultimately done through group process. That person has got to be powerful, self-confident, and very competent in their communication skills because so easily can the situation get out of hand, and we certainly saw that um, in the trial of the century. Um, the leader lost control. And unfortunately, when the leader loses control, then things turn chaotic. And so there's got to be a sense of leadership, but not chaos. Now, another, some, another important assumption, uh, which uh, comes directly from these first two, is that all groups must balance task and socio-emotional concerns. You can't forget the task at hand. You've got to be concerned with where you're going and what you're doing. But at the same time, you can't ignore people's needs. People have needs in groups. And there's got to be some tension release. There's got to be a, a good sense of emotions. You know, people have got to feel good about what's going on. Um, they've got to feel like they're stroked. So these things are important too. And so it's complicated to balance the two, to move from one to the other. Something else that's important um, to be aware of is that discussion is not an end in itself. Um, it should be a means to achieving goals. Some groups feel like they just need to get together and talk. And sometimes, if the goal is a socio-emotional one, then that's important too. But there should be some reason for the talk, um, whether if it's to create harmony, whether it's to solve a task. There should be some goal in mind 
for the discussion. Otherwise, it's meaningless verbiage. Something else that we have to be aware of is that groups are interdependent, that a change in one member of the system will affect the other members of the system. Suppose you're working on a group project. Now, how many of you have worked on group projects in your classes? All of you? Well, we have a lot of group projects at St. Thomas, especially in our media classes. And I have a steady stream of students into my office all the time, um, especially with the TV classes and the TV projects, that X, who's supposed to be the camera person hasn't shown up that day, and how are they going to shoot their script without the camera person? Well, it's a serious problem. If the behavior of one member of the group is dysfunctional, then this is going to affect all other members of the group. It's a fact of life. You know, we like to think, well, it isn't going to affect us, but it does. So when we're dealing with groups, we have to be sure that all our members are functioning. If somebody seems alienated or apathetic, we need to do everything in our power to bring them back into the group situation so they're involved. Because that one alienated person, that one apathetic person, can affect the group climate and ultimately the outcome. Some theorists say that cohesiveness is the most important or one of the most important things that group members have got to have. Now, cohesiveness has to do with mutual interest among all group members. Has anybody ever belonged to a cohesive group where you look forward to going to it? That it was a very important part of your life. Baseball team. Your baseball team. If you're a member of a baseball team and you enjoy the people, whether you enjoy them or not, the game itself, yeah, you're looking forward to going forward every single day, day after day. I'm sure we've all belonged to groups like that. I belong to a group in, in uh, college. Um, I went to USC, and the, the group that I loved was mortarboard. And it was a group of professionally oriented women who were very concerned with social action, uh, very concerned with academics, and making some kind of difference on the campus. I thoroughly enjoyed going to those meetings. They were never long. People cared about each other. They cared about the group. It was a very exciting group to belong to. Um, I belonged to groups in... Uh, recent years <laughs> where I look at my watch and I think when will this be over and we've all been to groups like that where the time is just so slow and you think will this never be over and can't they you know you know wrap it up well probably what's missing in those groups is a sense of cohesiveness um, this mutual interest in group members where everybody cares about each other where everybody cares about the mission um, or the task of the group. Now, there's a caveat th there, though, with cohesiveness. With every good thing, there's always too much. Aristotle called this the golden mean. And Aristotle said there's a golden mean in all things. And even with cohesiveness, there can be too much cohesiveness. Now, there's a condition that occurs with cohesiveness called groupthink. Now, groupthink is a special situation where there's usually a very charismatic leader. Uh, and this leader is exciting, uh, kind of plots the direction for the group, uh, people feel very loyal toward this person. The group members care about each other. <coughs> they care about the leader. 
and they have feelings of that they are special, um, that they're kind of the chosen ones, um, that they're invulnerable to anything that can happen to them. And unfortunately, something happens with these groups when an idea or ideas are posed. Usually they go with the first or second idea. And if a counter idea or any kind of negative criticism comes up, that tends to be ignored. Well, the result of all of this is poor decision making. And unfortunately, when you don't deal with the possible consequences of every possible idea that you come up with, you can have disaster. And there have been some classic groupthink disasters in our society and others. Can anybody think of any? <coughs> yes. Uh, I can't remember what it's called, but the David Koresh in, uh, in Waco. Yes. Excellent example. You know, where things weren't thought out correctly. Jim Jones is another example um, of where uh, another cult leader, where people followed and consequences weren't thought through. Yes? Uh, what about Watergate? Okay, excellent example. Watergate. You know, whoo, what were they thinking of? You know, you, and you, at, you, you, know, you know, when you look back in retrospect, you think, what could they have been thinking of? How could they have thought that they could fool around with the power of the presidency or the power of the executive office? And moreover, when they had made a mistake, why didn't they fess up to it and take the punishment? Why did they try to cover it up? Another classic example is the Bay of Pigs, uh, where, uh, again, Kennedy was a very charismatic leader. They did not think through the possibility of disaster and failure. Another example was Carter and his helicopters during the Iran problems with the hostages. You know, they didn't envision a sandstorm and all the helicopters crashing in the desert. Uh, problems. The Trojan horse. Um, Barbara Tuckman, uh, who is a famous historian, calls these instances marches to folly. And she's written a book by the same name. If you ever get a chance to read it, it's one of those that's worth reading. A uh, very profound book on groupthink maneuvers, where people do not think through the consequences of their ideas, um, where there's so much cohesiveness, so much camaraderie, that they lead each other to disaster. And of course, one of the classic historical examples was Hitler, who led a nation to disaster uh, with ghastly ramifications. So groupthink is important, but we have to remember what can happen with groupthink. That, um, Cohesiveness can be good, but sometimes uh, it can be flawed. Okay, another uh, concern that we have in groups is power and control. Whenever people feel like they don't have power, or at least they don't have the possibility for coalition formation, they begin to feel apathetic or alienated. If they have no influence, why bother? You know, why should I invest myself in this? Nobody's going to listen to what I say. Yes? But those folks, too, is that they will not only turn out to be the destructive from within the group, they will plant your seeds of dissension, begin rumors, gossip, arguendo. If it's a business venture, don't be shocked if your ideas are all of a sudden on your competitor's lap because that person feels powerless, but this other group that's willing to make him feel important will take him in for the purpose of taking the group's ideas away. If you're in direct competition, say, for a patent, and it has to be kept secret, and this one person has no 
feeling of power or belonging, where would he find such a feeling? From the competitor who will gladly take him in at that moment. But when he's done with him, he's going to be right back where he started from. Okay, excellent example. Power is important. And that doesn't mean that gives us, as groups, um, the ability to abuse power. But we have to be sure that everyone feels like they've got some kind of influence. Uh, influence is very, very important. I had a really interesting experience with that. I used to uh, teach over here about 15 years ago. Uh, I was a, a lecturer when I was finishing up my dissertation uh, before I went to St. Thomas. And I uh, taught a very interesting class. I don't know if it still is here on campus. It was called Communication uh, in the Classroom. And it was for the education department. And uh, it was a really fun class to teach. And we did all kinds of neat exercises. And one of the exercises we did was on power. And we played a game. And this game was called Star Power. And it's a simulation game. And you deal out all these chips and cards. And people exchange chips and cards not knowing what they count as. Well. Um, after about three or four rounds of this, then you tell people who are the ones in power. And it's usually one or two. And the people in power have all the ability to make the rules. Well, I'd been teaching this class for several years. I'd seen classes get at each other's throats, uh, feel very annoyed with each other, and especially those persons of power. And then, I think the last semester that I taught it here, I had a very sharp group. And again, we had, I think, two people who had the, you know, the predominant number of chips. Um, each one of, they were one and two. And they had about maybe 40% between them of the power. And everybody else had, you know, maybe 5%, 1%, 10%. And so I said, OK, have at it, folks. What are you going to do with this situation? Two seconds, the 28 people who had no power immediately formed a coalition, got 60%, and negotiated with the ones that did. I thought, wow, what a sharp group. And they immediately saw through you know, all the power, the struggles um, to develop some ways of dealing with this difficult situation. So when people are in less powerful situations, the way to deal with that, of course, if, especially if you're the one who doesn't have the power, is form a coalition so that you can uh, maintain your influence and you can balance power. Because if power is not balanced, it will get out of hand. And we've also seen that throughout history. When, when groups or people have too much power, it's unfortunate. Um, and then one of the last steps, um, or last assumptions that we want to talk about is conflict. Conflict in any group is inevitable. I don't care how cohesive the group is, how wonderful the group is, how satisfying the group is, there will always be conflict. Unfortunately, we all think of conflict as a bad thing. Well, it isn't. Conflict is only dysfunctional in terms of its resolution or its management. So I'd like to t take the remaining few minutes of the class and talk about conflict in detail. Because conflict is one of those issues that we have to deal with at all times. And if we manage that conflict, then conflict can be a catharsis rather than destructive. Now what is conflict? When you think of conflict, what do you think of? Yes. Lack of peace, lack of continuity, 
uh, inevitable hypothetical bumps in the road, something that's going to stall the accomplishment of whatever the task is that you have to reach. Uh, it could be good conflict, it could be bad conflict, but nonetheless, you're not going to get where you want to go according to your own plans. Somebody's going to throw a stone wall up somewhere to keep you from getting where you want to go. Okay, excellent. Um, I heard in your comment, though, that many times, now you did have a positive note there, too, uh, but so many times people think of conflict as negative, that we've got to avoid conflict, um, that we have to kind of sweep things under the rug. Unfortunately, we can't do that, especially in groups. We have to face up to our conflicts and solve them. Basically, all conflict is, is happen, it happens when people are committed to incompatible courses of action designed to achieve some goal. Um, and our class member said that so very well. You have bumps in the road. You have people pulling apart, going in two directions at the same time. Uh, I always think of the, the old, you know, the old buggy, you know, that goes along the, the road and one horse goes this way and the other horse goes that way and whoop, the wagon pulls apart and the wheels come off. Well, and that's what happens to groups, metaphorically speaking, when people go in two directions at the same time. There are five characteristics of conflict. The first is goes back to a communication principle. Conflicts are dynamic. They are ever-changing, ever-flowing. They do not stay in the same place, just like communication doesn't stay in the same place. I kind of like to think about conflict, or at least the dynamic aspect of conflict, like waves on a shore or a river you know, flowing in its banks. Um, that old statement that says you never can step in the same place in the river twice. It's because the river is always changing its current. It's always changing its channel. Um, does anybody like to go beach combing? We went, to, my youngest son and I went to California this summer to visit my mother, and we always have to have that requisite visit down to the tidal pools in Laguna Beach. They're especially pretty. And uh, we had been down there for about two hours. And my son was really disappointed because um, Laguna Beach is beach comb to the max. Um, there were almost no shells. And the shells that we did find were broken. And so my youngest son was pretty disappointed. He wanted so much to find a pretty shell to take home to his dad. And so, um, we were just about ready to go, and this huge wave comes up, and sure enough, a shell comes right into our tidal pool. And it was whole, and it was pretty, and it was neat. And he was so excited. And I thought, aha, an example of, for dynamism and for process. It's always changing. And just because something is as it is at one time doesn't mean that it's going to be that way another time. So it's always changing um, in its uh, ever-present and, and it's dynamic. Something else that conflicts are, they're relational. Now certainly uh, we can have interpersonal conflicts and we call that cognitive dissonance. But our, for our purposes, we're concerned with relational conflicts. We're concerned with incompatibilities between two people, or three people, or five people, or 20 people. They're contextual. They don't arise in a vacuum. They arise out of a situation. But we've got a problem here. Sometimes the conflict that arises is not actually the conflict that is. Um, my major area of research is relational communication. and. I did an interesting study uh, about 15 years ago that had to do with marital couples. And I had them discuss a variety of different things. And 
one was a very neutral topic, one was a conflict topic. Well, depending on certain types of couples, they're going to argue over anything, no matter what it is. And that's, of course, what I was trying to prove in my dissertation, and fortunately I found it and I got my degree. But this one couple in particular got in practically a knockdown, drag out fight over what television program to watch. Yes? As you women develop something that you tag us with the title, it's called Flippers. You give a man a remote control, that's it, ladies. No more television for you tonight. That's it. Don't let your husband or your boyfriend get a hold of the remote control. You keep that out of the man's hand, you won't have a fight. <laughs> Good point. What was so interesting about this is that the contextual argument was television. Ah, that was not the argument. It was over who has the right to control. And of course it's moi. You know, it's always moi. Me, I should control. And so um, this is the problem in groups. Um, they're contextual. Um, and we have to go beyond sometimes the immediate conflict to try and figure out sometimes what's really going on. Is it a power problem? Is it an alienation problem? Or is it merely whether we should sell pizza or donuts? You know, what is the problem? And then it's perceptual. And we've already talked about how important perceptions are. Sometimes we can thoroughly agree. We can, under, we can be in agreement. But because we are so entrenched in our own position, we can't see what the other person's saying. So conflicts are always perceptual. And then lastly, they are disruptive. Even if they're good, um, and many conflicts are very important. They clear the air. Uh, sometimes they move groups out of ruts. They're still disruptive. You cannot go back to the same patterns. You've got to develop new blueprints, new plans, new goals. You've got to go in different directions. And when groups go wrong, they say they talk out their problem and they go through all their problem-solving methods, and then they go right back to what they've been doing before. And sure enough, the problem arises again. You've got to come up with new blueprints. And that's one of the hardest things in the world to do, is develop those new blueprints. Now let's talk um, for a few minutes about the types of conflicts and the causes of conflicts. The types of conflicts are basically two. We have what we call distributive conflicts. This is a win-lose situation. I win, you lose. These are ultimately dysfunctional. And again, we saw a wonderful example, or shall we say a ghastly example, of a dysfunctional conflict uh, last night on Nightline. And a lot of the reactions that surrounded the verdict of the trial were these types of win-lose reactions. In order to solve problems, in order to solve conflicts, we've got to get beyond that. We've got to get to what we call an integrative or a win-win situation, where we all win. We don't have to all lose. We all have to win. But we have to negotiate. We have to compromise. And above all, we have to understand each other and understand each other's position. Now, there are a variety of causes of conflicts. Uh, there can be a variety of causes of conflicts. The first of these is a procedural conflict. Now, a procedural conflict is the easiest to deal with because it's a conflict over the course of action to be taken to reach some goal. For example, suppose you're a group of elementary school teachers and you're teaching first grade. And some of you belong to the phonics camp some of you belong to the whole language camp. Uh, some of you belong to the both camp. 
And each of you are entrenched in your particular situation. But you're dealing with a task. You're dealing with an issue. When things can stick to issues, it's easier. Also, you're all concerned with the same goal. You want the children to learn to read. You're just merely conflicting over methods. And so methodologies should be able to be dealt with. There should be a win-win situ situation here where a variety of these methods can be employed. Yes? It really makes no difference what kind of work you do there. Sometimes when win-win just won't work, neither will lose-lose. And you take the example that you gave us, the town meeting. The underlying current from the town meeting was a trial. This is an adversarial system. Um, the prosecution never offered the defendant a plea bargain where everybody could go away with a win-win, manslaughter too. It wasn't even an option. They were so hungry for the publicity of getting a conviction. They gave the defendant no choice. It was all or nothing. Blame not the defendant then for exercising his rights under the system, which has now divisively divided a nation along racial lines. But the prosecution, the state which had the power, offered no remedy to the defendant. And you look up at these types of conflict, one and two, he's, he doesn't have a choice. Either you win or you lose, but that's all you've got. Yes, and that's very true. There's some, uh, and a football game too, you know, a, a less, you know, extreme example. But I mean, the Oilers aren't going to go to the team next week and say, here's our plays, let's all win. You know, they're not going to do that. Do it anyway every week, so what's <laughs> the difference? They're, they're not going to, um, you know, certain situations that are competitive situations are that way. The only thing I'm saying here is that when you do find yourself in a competitive situation, when you find yourself in a win-lose situation, you're more likely to have the destructive aspects of conflict. Now, there's certain aspects of our society where this is built in. The court system is one of them. And hopefully, now, uh, worse, our situation here um, is a group and a group situation, and hopefully it won't get into that adversarial kind of situation. <coughs> hopefully in your group management, you can develop systems where everybody can win. But your point is certainly well taken. Some aspects of our society are adversarial. To treat them, I mean, if you're in com competition to, if you were Bill Gates at Microsoft, are you going to help the guy down the street who's doing OS2? No. How do you think Microsoft, how do you think Gates became the richest man in the world? He had this little idea called Windows. Look what he gave us. Well, this is an aspect of our society that we have to deal with. The, um, some of the Native American cultures don't deal with things that way. They deal with things not in terms of justice or retribution. They deal th with things in terms of restoring harmony. And, but that takes a different way of thinking. And that, again, goes to our win-win situation. But enough of the courts. Moving right along to another type of situation is the substantive situation. The substantive situation is where you're disagreeing over goals. Maybe your parents wanted you to be an accounting major, but you wanted to be a communication major. Different goals. So what do you do? Double major. <laughs> or, um, you don't have double majors here? Um, yeah, well, that would be one way to do it. Or major in one, minor in the other. No? Um, with, with, with integrative ideas, you have to engage in flexible thinking. You know, it's, you're looking at how can we all win here? Um, how can we best deal with this situation where everybody can come out ahead? And then, of course, the most difficult type of conflict is the interpersonal one. And this is the one that um, disintegrates into threats and bluffs and uh, name calling. And it's usually over attitudes, values, beliefs, uh, personal characteristics, sometimes even abilities. Uh, when one person can't do something, 
you know, we tend to lambast that person. And whenever we get into these interpersonal kinds of conflicts, then we move toward uh, a dysfunctional or a destructive conflict. Well, how, what do we do with all this? Well, we try to manage it in the best way that we can. And there are four prerequisites that are necessary to resolving any conflict functionally. The first one is focus on cooperation rather than competition. As long as we are competing, we will not resolve our conflict. We have got to cooperate. We've got to negotiate. We've got to seek to understand one another. Secondly, we acknowledge that a problem exists. And moreover, we try to define what that problem is. Thirdly, uh, we move to hoping for a change. We've got to envision a new world, a new life. You know that wonderful song from Jekyll and Hyde where the heroine sings a new life. That's a great song. But it's a very important concept. Envisioning a different path, a different goal, a different way of doing things. Um, and then lastly, and sometimes this is the hardest, is willing to take action. You know, we may have the first three, but boy, it's hard to get up and move. Um, sometimes it's very hard to translate uh, attitudes or beliefs into behaviors. And in order for uh, conflict to be resolved, it's got to be behavioral. Well, there's a, a variety of things that we can do to manage um, the conflicts that we can have. If people are still speaking with each other and they are rational, then we can focus um, on the problem solution discussion method. This is very much like Dewey's approach to problem solving or thinking. And basically, um, you identify the problem as a group what is the problem. You um, discuss the scope and the ramifications of the problem. You know, is this a small problem or is it immense? You know, raising $5,000 is a relatively small problem. Um, trying to resolve 100 years of racial tensions is an immense problem. So you have to deal with the scope of the problem and all of the different ramifications of that problem uh, for the parties involved. The third thing you do is you brainstorm. And in brainstorming, you don't come to immediate decisions. You throw out the wildest, most creative, most interesting types of solutions that you can come up with. Um, you are practical, you are idealistic, um, your best guess, you try to come up with everything that you possibly can. Then what you do is you apply a series of consequences to each decision that you come up with. What's the feasibility of doing this? Can we do this? What are the ramifications if we accomplish this particular kind of solution? So what you're doing is you're doing a little critical thinking here. You know, um, some may be wonderful uh, in an idealistic world, but practically, we just can't do it. I'd love to solve all of the poverty in the world but I probably won't be able to do it. And then lastly, we choose the best solution, and then we evaluate. Then there are other kinds of situations, role-playing, simulation games, and third-party methods that are also ways of developing ways of resolving conflicts. You only use the third party when people are no longer talking. I believe we have run out of time. I hope you all have great success in all the meetings that you manage.